Today we're going to talk about sick care versus health care in America. As way of disclaimers, I have no financial issues to disclose at this time. A little bit about myself. I am from rural Missouri. I grew up in a town of about 400. I grew up on a dairy farm. I'm board certified in internal medicine. I function as the vice president of medical education and program director for internal medicine for Freeman Health Systems in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, I'm interested in family, uh, production of music, I'm a history enthusiast, and I'm an exercise fanatic. So my introduction to this topic really began as a journey of self-discovery and self-concern, to be honest. Uh, this is my family. Uh, here am I, uh, and then my parents and my siblings, uh, era 1978. And uh, at that time, a uh, good-looking, healthy, happy bunch. But uh, it turns out that uh, my protoplasm uh, that I inherited in my family uh, certainly has some interesting deficits. By the time my older brother Guy was seven, he was a type 1 diabetic. Uh, my mother went on to be diabetic. My father suffered his first heart attack at the age of 40. Uh, my sister certainly had her fair share of health troubles. And my little brother, who is not in this picture yet, uh, would go on to have insulin-dependent diabetes by the time he was 30. And I myself have been the healthy one of the group. Uh, but even I am on the spectrum of insulin resistance and have some dyslipidemia. And so in looking at my family's uh, health issues, I, I have very much been focused in on what I can do to avoid suffering the same health fate as uh, all of uh, my, my family. So as Healthcare providers, we've all been subject to this comment at one point or another. All my doctor ever does is push pills at me. It's almost like the best insult that you can make about your physician. And for some reason, it does look to the layperson like healthcare being provided has something to do with the number of pills and prescriptions that your physician provides to you. I would say that I really got interested in this topic probably about eight years ago. I was at a ACGME conference and in conversation with one of the speakers from Mayo, they let slip this little, this little snippet here. Uh, and basically they said that the impact of medical interventions and medications on people's overall health, mm, probably around 10 to 15%, but the impact of a healthy lifestyle was 40 to 50 percent and I'll tell you what that means to me is my ability to out medicate a toxic lifestyle is not what I want it to be and that really got me to thinking about how I approach my own health and how I approach the health of my patients from a perspective that I don't think I was well prepared in medical school to think about so really what does it take to have good health? I would argue that the foundation of health are these things, nutrition, cholesterol control, a good amount of recurrent physical activity, weight control, a good amount of high quality sleep, and then avoiding putting excess toxins in our body. You know, this is really the foundation. This is 60 to 70% of our health. And whereas medications and medical interventions, this probably represents that 10 to 15%. So in my mind, most of my career has been about taking care of this 10 or 15% and then very little application to the rest, very little focus on the foundations of health. And, and of course, then the question is, what happens when we have no foundations for our health? Well, I would argue, you know, we end up with patients that aren't very healthy and have about 32 prescriptions at any given time. And that just really does not make sense 
when we stop and think about it. Looking at CDC stats from 2019, uh, what we know is that greater than 2.6 million Americans uh, die every year. And the top three causes are heart disease, cancers, and chronic respiratory disease. And these three diagnoses account for 50% of all the deaths. But if we add the number seven cause, diabetes, then that number skyrockets to 80% of all the deaths in the United States, which is unfortunate. Uh, so anybody that knows me will certainly have heard me say something like this at one point or another. 80% of health problems in one way or another turn out to be self-inflicted. And I truly believe that that's the case. And uh, as it applies to these four diagnoses, here's the thing that connects them. All of those diseases uh, are affected by the same list of risk factors, tobacco use, poor diet, physical inactivity, too much alcohol use, uncontrolled blood pressure problems, dyslipidemia. And, and the sad and ironic thing about that is all of these things have very effective treatments available to us today. And despite that, uh, they're still the top killers of our citizens. So this uh, table comes to us from the InterHeart study, which is a huge study that involved 52 countries uh, looking at modifiable risk factors associated with myocardial infarction. And as we look at this, uh, this came out of Lancet 2004, but when you look at this pie graph, none of us are gonna be super surprised to see that the, the lion's share of the risk factors are lipids. Uh, th this next guy here, smoking, yep, yep, that makes pretty good sense to us. Even hypertension has a, a fairly substantial uh, um, amount of exposure there on the chart. But here I think is the interesting thing that was an eye-opener for me. This piece of the pie, that looks pretty considerable. What is it? Well, it turns out that psychosocial mental health issues are a considerable, in fact, the number three modifiable risk factor for myocardial infarctions, which I think is something that I had never thought about before and certainly had never addressed in my patient population from a, a risk of MI perspective, certainly. So kind of an eye opener for me. And we look further down the rabbit hole at that. I think that this is some really interesting and encouraging uh, data. So here we see that for men or women who have made it to the age of 50 without a cardiovascular disease, if they've optimized their risk, then for men, they have a 5% chance of going on to having a cardiovascular issue in their lifetime. And for women, if they've made it that far, they have an 8% chance that they'll go on to have a cardiovascular event. So there's great reasons why optimizing our risk is tremendously beneficial to our patients. Look what happens when you start to add on risk factors. If you have two or more major risk factors for cardiovascular disease, men's risk goes from 5% to 69%. For women, it goes from 8% to 50%. So being able to keep control of those lifestyle risk factors makes a tremendous difference in outcome for our patients. And when you look at these low risk factor status patients, you know, 73 to 85% lower risk for cardiovascular disease, 40 to 60% lower mortality rates. And we're adding back six to 10 healthy years of life expectancy if we can just control lifestyle issues. That's pretty powerful in my opinion. Now I live and work in Missouri and so just as a, a point to plant our feet and have a conversation we'll take a look at that but wherever you are in the country you'll probably see, me, see some of your data uh, pass across the screen as well. So when you look at overall health scoring 
uh, you can see that the United States aggregate is here. So this is the midpoint. And unfortunately for my practice and my patients and family, here's Missouri. So you can see we don't even make it to the 50 yard line as far as health score aggregates. And why is that? Well, it turns out that here in Missouri, almost one in five patients uh, suffer from uh, troubled drinking habits, which can have a considerable impact on their overall health and is completely modifiable. And there are there are certainly worth states out there, uh, but Missouri's definitely got some room for improvement. When we look at smoking data for Missouri, this is kind of a good news, bad news slide. You can see that uh, the rates of smoking are going down in Missouri, and, and that's good over time. But the bad news is, is that this is the U.S. median scoring. And so even though we do kind of follow that trend, we're still higher than the overall uh, U.S. Uh, averages. And that's uh, room for improvement on our part. Looking at obesity, I think that this is probably something that we're super aware of uh, in our in our practice in primary care. But I think that it still bears seeing that from 1990 to 2016, nationwide, we went from one in 10 of our patients being labeled as obese to almost one in three. And that is, uh, has tremendous impacts on overall health. Now, I have a lot of patients who will tell me that obesity is not really a health problem and it's lifestyle, it's aesthetic. But I think that the data would really argue that that's not the case. When you look at all-cause mortality based on BMI, what you can see here, that whether you're a man or a woman, it's not really a good idea to be too thin, but definitely as BMI increases, your mortality certainly climbs with that. This is an interesting uh, data chart looking at the overall increases in relative risk of cancers. Uh, based upon incremental weight increases above normal. And what you can see is that for many of these cancers, uh, for every five kilo increase, you're seeing an increase in relative risk of acquiring that disease. And, and that's certainly something to be considered and be thoughtful about. I think that this is really profound when you look at how linked colorectal cancers are to weight increases. You know, this relative risk is being bumped by a, a 2.2 pound increase. And that's, uh, that's easy to do. So I think it's something to be very thoughtful about when we're talking to our patients who maybe already have a family history of cancer risk. I don't think anybody in the audience will be surprised to see that there's a clear correlation between increasing BMI and insulin resistance and frank diabetes risk, especially in the female population. That information's been pretty well known uh, for quite some time. This came out of Annals of Internal Medicine in 1995. And of course, the, the correlations to hypertension and obesity are, are very well documented as well. Now, for all of that, when we actually look at where we're going in the United States, even before COVID, uh, we had had a fall three years running in overall life expectancies. Uh, it was on decline before the pandemic, and I'm sure that the pandemic did nothing to help with that as well. And you can see that when you're looking at uh, the other industrialized nations uh, represented here on the chart, that you know we were pretty far down that pack already in 2015. So it's a bit alarming that life expectancy continues to fall. And I think that that is, you know, when you think about the improvements in life expectancy, a lot of that was being driven by vaccinations in the pediatric population that was adding substantial lifespan to the population. 
but now we've kind of gotten to the other side of that spectrum, in my opinion, where now we're not able to out-medicate the problems of a chronically unhealthy adult population with what I would describe as a toxic lifestyle. And when you look at, well, what does it cost us to get this uh, suboptimal care and suboptimal outcomes, you know, I would point out that we are spending tremendously more in GDP than our neighbors around the world. So we're spending, we're throwing a lot of money at the situation, but that that excess cost is not translating into improved outcomes. I don't think we can outspend this problem. So when you look at overall GDP expenditures, you can see the U.S. in 2019 was a little bit over 17% of GDP expenditures in just healthcare compared to an overall average of all these other countries of somewhere between 8 and 9%. So we are quite the spender on healthcare. And if you're not a GDP kind of thinker, then this chart says it in terms that I would understand better. In the year 2000, we were spending about mm, slightly less than one and a half trillion dollars in healthcare expenses. And by 2017, we were spending almost three and a half trillion dollars. And so I don't know how often we can continue to triple our care our costs, but I would argue there's got to be an upper limit of that at which beyond we just can't go. And of course, if you're wondering who bears the brunt of those costs, the sum of it certainly does fall onto our patients. You know, uh, our average 85 year old plus patient is on a very fixed income. These costs in care are just really skyrocket as we age. And that has got to be a major financial burden for our senior citizens. Now, this information comes to us from the American Heart Association, and I think it's really fascinating. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a grade card uh, looking at where we were in 2005 and projecting to 2020 uh, what we thought we would get to and what did we actually get to looking at things like smoking, diet, physical activity, BMI, insulin resistance, that sort of thing. And these are divided up into male and female populations, U.S. citizens only. So when you look at this uh, smoking trend, so in 2005, we were doing a pretty good job with that. Uh, more people than not uh, were not smokers. Uh, we had projected that by 2020, here's where we would be. And what we saw was here's where we are. So we, we did better than we expected. So I think that that kind of jives with what we know about smoking trends in this country, which is fantastic. But I put this slide on here because I wanted to talk to you about healthy diet. So this is based on the criteria for a healthy diet by the American Heart Association. So not a radical group of uh, vegetarians or anything too outlandish. But look at where we were in 2005. I, I would argue that's got to be over 75% had a very toxic diet. Uh, the yellow is kind of the intermediate. And this little bitty speck of green that you almost have to hallucinate to see here. That is the percentage of American citizens who are meeting the, a, the American Heart Association's criteria for a healthy diet. And I know my eyesight's not that good at 50, but I can barely see that line. And by the time we get to 2020, what you can see here is, well, we have more intermediate eaters to absolutely dismal eaters. But the people that are actually eating a healthy diet really hasn't changed much. And uh, for all you ladies out there that are, are, are mocking our, our, our male compatriots, I would say the AHA really is not too impressed by, by your eating habits either. So a lot of, lot of room for improvement there. When we think about the human life cycle, I was always left with this model, you know, we're born, we spend half of our, our time uh, maturing to an adult, 
then we kind of plateau for a third of our life and then we just start to fall apart and become decrepit and then ultimately are non-functional and then that's it for us and so and that that's just been the model i think that's been kind of ingrained in all of us almost unconsciously for my my entire life and this is just how it is but as i spend more and more time looking at healthcare and looking at the data i really think that that life cycle model is inaccurate and i'm really starting to think in my mind that i don't think that we necessarily have this cycle of decrepitude over the last 50 percent of our life as much as what we're seeing is the results of neglect versus maintenance now uh, as just an analogy you know these are both 1951 jeep willies produced the same year this one is a rust bucket that's completely non-functional and this one's roadworthy this one's ready to hit the trail so I, I in my mind this is a good mental model for what i see playing out with my own health and and my patients so i'm going to argue that a lot of the disease and decrease in quality of life that we see in our adult populations are based more on neglect more than we run out of telomeres and our genes shut off and it's just inevitable that our hate, our health has to fade away that rapidly and to help me hopefully make that point with you guys i'd like to share with you just the best slide i've ever run across so this is again from the American Heart Association uh, 2019 data, and I love this chart so much. So what you see here on the x-axis is the number of ideal health behaviors. You know, do you exercise? Do you get good sleep? Did you eat the right things? Are you engaged in healthy behaviors? This is overall mortality or, or uh, incidence of disease and then this uh, axis is number of ideal health factors so hypertension diabetes obesity that sort of thing and so you guys are smart you're not going to be too surprised to find out that if you have all the good behaviors and you were born with great protoplasm no no significant family issues then your overall health risk is going to be impressively low that makes great sense and on the other side of that equation if you have no good health behaviors if you just live a completely toxic lifestyle and you're born with bad protoplasm well life's not going to be very good for you you know and that makes perfectly good sense too but i think that the utility of this chart and the reason why i like it so much is how it applies to somebody like myself you know uh, just because of my family history and genetics I'm slightly dysmetabolic and uh, I have a little bit of dyslipidemia as well so I would argue that on the number of, of uh, ideal health risk factors I'm gonna have to put myself somewhere down in this range here but I have mastered the art of ideal health behaviors and so I'm able to keep my overall risk of coronary artery disease in this range. That's as good as I can do. But look at this. If you have perfect protoplasm, you just got lucky and your family is, has stellar genes, and you have the worst toxic lifestyle of all time, look where your risk may end up. Here's my risk here's your risk so what this slide has to tell us is that regardless of the health factors that you're born with your health behaviors have a tremendous impact on what happens to us we can't just blame our poor protoplasm for our outcomes this is a tool these health behaviors are tools that are going to mitigate risk considerably and far more powerful than being lucky in the gene pool so I, I for me this gives me encouragement to be able to go back to my patients and tell them 
effort can absolutely equal outcome and they should definitely take advantage of this. So in my mind, we all are healthcare workers, but what we're really doing is we're providing sick care. So we are taking care of secondary prevention. We're dealing with people who already have diseases. And in my mind, that's not health care, that's sick care. Health care is health maintenance, keeping healthy people healthy. Two completely different phenomenon in my mind. And so, you know, for a lot of my career, you know, we would allow patients to slowly give away their health until they reached a critical point where they just could not go on ignoring their health issues. And then we would decide that we need to make an intervention when they've already almost sealed their fate at times. And so that's that's kind of been my experience. Whereas with the healthcare that I want to talk about it looks a lot more like this. You know, this gentleman is 72 and this this lady is 68. You know, and I would argue that probably the vast majority of the people in the audience regardless of age would probably be willing to change physiques uh, with these with these two people so if this cycle of you just get old and fall apart and it's inevitable is so true then why are there fantastic examples of people who do the maintenance who have very robust health and very high function and high quality of life into their 80s 90s hundreds so that's what I want to talk about today with you guys. So if what we've been calling healthcare is really sick care, what does real healthcare actually look like? Well, let's start with exercise and its overall impacts on health. So in 2008, this uh, uh, Pixar movie called WALL-E came out and it is a okay film but the thing that uh, I really liked about it was they poked a lot of fun on the fact that over time human beings were slowly losing the ability to walk which at the time I thought was hilarious but uh, years later as healthcare provider it seems ominously prescient to me and to the American Heart Association as well so you can see in this graph looking at overall trends in physical activity from 1998 to 2016 there is a slow and continuous trend into worsening inactivity so i want to look at some studies looking at the overall impacts on health both in primary prevention and secondary prevention as impacted by exercise this study comes out of the uk and it looks at a lot of meta-analyses looking at numerous health conditions. And the thing I want to point out about this data is their definition of exercise, because I think it's fascinating. So their definition of exercise is 30 minutes a day, five times a week activity of mild to moderate intensity. So basically they're talking about walking the dog or taking a wife uh, um, on a walk or a spouse on a walk and uh, you know having a love stroll so we're not talking about going to the gym and uh, trying to pick up a car that sort of thing so this is a very modest amounts of physical activity but even at that level look at the outcomes overall all-cause mortality drops 30 percent for taking that love stroll the risk of heart disease goes down by 40%. That's the number one killer of adults. Hypertension drops by 50%. Strokes, which terrify me, the risk drops by 30%. You cut your risk of diabetes in half. Uh, cancer risk, breast cancer risk drop by 25%. Uh, GI cancers drop by 45% risk. Uh, dementia, another thing that terrifies me, uh, my my great grandmother had a pretty considerable case of Alzheimer's. I'd rather avoid that. Just my little bit of exercise drops that risk by 30%. Back pain risk down by 
major fractures by 50%. Pretty impressive stuff. Now, imagine if you could bottle up a pill or a procedure that would give that many health benefits to that many different diseases, well, that would be lucrative. If, if, I, if I was able to package that up, I would probably make enough money to buy New Zealand and uh, live there for the rest of my life, and I probably would. So this is a very powerful tool that is very well documented to be extremely effective and at pretty low levels of activity. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, well, that's primary prevention, but a lot of my patients already have these diseases, so the cows are out of the barn. What good is exercise at that point? Well, there are studies looking at the effect of exercise on secondary prevention. This comes to us from the BMJ. And so looking at this forest plot, what you can see when you're looking at major diseases like heart disease, stroke, uh, diabetes, you know, it's no, no mystery to us that statins, beta blockers, ACEs, ARBs, antiplatelets are all good for secondary prevention. But here's exercise, a pretty similar profile. Now, I, I'm not saying that exercise should replace these as treatment, but I think in adjunct, I think that there's strong evidence that says exercise is absolutely an important tool for secondary prevention in heart disease. But look at stroke. You know, here we got anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So here's your Plavix and your aspirin. And here's my 30 minute walk five days a week. This is some pretty robust evidence that we need to do more than throw a statin and an antiplatelet agent at our stroke patients. They, the more active they are, the better we are at keeping them healthy and preventing recurrent strokes. So when you look at this study, you know, the bottom line from the authors is this. Exercise and many drug interventions are often potentially similar in terms of their mortality benefits, especially in related to secondary prevention of heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and prevention of diabetes. So that's a pretty profound tool that we need to take advantage of. I add this photo of George Jedinoff era 2017 for your consideration. So the reason why I thought that this would be uh, interesting to you is that uh, this man on his skis is a hundred years old and is having a great time with a high quality of existence and truly enjoying his life, which I think when I think about my 60 to 100 year population, the idea of them being up on their feet or out of a walker uh, and onto skis is just almost unfathomable. And this is a 65 year old uh, competitive bodybuilder. Uh, who seems to be doing pretty well as herself. But uh, there's probably a few people in the audience who are thinking, well, those people have been active a very long time. You know, they probably were athletes as children and they've stayed very active their entire lives and thus they have those benefits. And then that certainly may be true. But for those who are saying, that's not me and the, that boat has sailed without me, so too bad for me. I'd like to introduce you to Charles uh, Eugster. So for those of you who do not know Charles, I, I first discovered him on a TED Talk talking about you know, the amazing effects of an active lifestyle in the senior citizen population. And the cool thing about Charles is he led a very sedate, what we would consider pretty normal life. He was a dentist in England for uh, his entire adult career, which I think is hilarious because look at his teeth. I'm definitely not getting any dental work done in England. And, um, and then he retired. And then at the age of 75, he decided, you know, I'm just kind of sitting here in my easy chair waiting to die and I don't feel good. And this doesn't seem like a good use of my time. I'm going to do something different. And that different thing that he did was he started to exercise and work out. And this led him on an interesting journey of uh, athleticism, 
that led to him competing in a world uh, masters level competitions where uh, you know in 2015 this guy won like five or six gold medals for running distances that I don't really want to run today Charles was born in 1919 uh, so you know he only started this health journey when he was retired in his late 70s and then decided to go to the gym and look at the look at the muscles on this guy he made incredible progress because of the stimulation of that training regime so I don't think that there is an age at which physical activity does not lead to potential benefits for any of us I mean look here he's up water skiing I'm only 50 and I can't water ski today so what a show off and this is my favorite quote from Charles you see the stupid thing is that people don't realize that you can have a beach body at 90 and turn the heads of those sexy 70 year old girls on the beach I'm living proof that if you eat right and exercise properly you can be that guy at any age and I think that that's a strong message that we need to start to inculcate into our medical thinking and into the advice that we're giving to our patients so here's my prescription for exercise so what do I do so I do 90 minutes of weightlifting and cardio six days per week my wife is my training partner and we just roll out of bed and do it before we head off to work and uh, that makes us happy but what do I recommend to everybody else well you know I think that the evidence is conclusive that 30 minutes of moderate walking or cardio five days per week is going to be the thing that makes us resistant to diseases and improves the quality of our life and function and probably adds considerably to our lifespan as well so if you want to stay alive and be functional do this if you want to be an underwear model then you know maybe you need to do something more like this all right let's switch gears and move on to diet and health so when you look at the American Heart Association data yeah, this is a chart looking at overall mortalities attributable to suboptimal diets and overall I think the 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 take home here is that a considerable amount of that of that mortality is coming from what we are ingesting so it kind of boils back to garbage in garbage out now uh, looking at cholesterol data you know there is a strong and compelling correlation between increasing plasma cholesterol and overall coronary risk now most of our primary care practitioners don't really get too excited until you get north of 200 and the reason for that is you can definitely see this considerable upswing in mortalities as you as you do that but if you go all the way back to 150 you know the risk is increasing from 150 to 200 so you know I, I don't think that we need to wait until you broach 200 before we start to have thoughts about is this really a healthy uh, lipid panel for our patients looking at the World Health Organization data on cholesterol I think is really interesting so this is broken up a couple different ways it's looking at uh, populations who do have uh, total cholesterol is greater than 190 uh, they're at least 25 years of age and then it's broken up into regions in the world and also broken up by socioeconomics and what you can see is uh, at least my interpretation is going to be the more industrialized your uh, your country the more likely you are to be dyslipidemic and also the richer you are you seem to be more at risk of dyslipidemia which I think this part of the slide is is far more fascinating to really think about you know typically as an American I think about people from a lower socioeconomic uh, position as having poor diets poor access to good nutrition and in the more wealthy affluent populations they have access to all the quote unquote good stuff and what this slide suggests is that no matter where you are in the world as you make more money and have more resources 
cholesterol go up because your diet changes. So as we become more wealthy and affluent, we start to Americanize our diet, and that tends to be a more processed food, meat-based diet, and it comes at the impact of dyslipidemia, which is too bad because one slide back we looked at the the correlation between dyslip dyslipidemia and mortalities, and there are definitely some correlations there. So I'm sure all of you have seen this before. This is the DASH diet. This is the original uh, cardiac recommendation for a good, healthy diet. And there's not a lot of surprises here. You know, a lot of breads and grains, a generous amount of recurrent fruits and veggies, um, middling amounts of the oils, fish, dairy, that sort of thing. But I think this is really interesting considering how old the DASH diet is. The red meat consumption, the uh, ice creams, the cakes. But I'm really looking at that steak, to be honest with you. Here was the original recommendation, monthly, or in small amounts. So even way back in the day when the DASH recommendations came out, we already knew that large amounts of recurrent red meat, which I would argue describes the American diet, was not a healthy choice and really should be treated more like an occasional treat. Once a month you go out for that ice cream cone, once a month you have a hamburger or a steak, which I would argue is not the American pattern that I grew up with. Now this is the Mediterranean diet pyramid and you can tell that it's the Mediterranean diet because it includes wine and dancing and so those are key features of course. Uh, but in addition to that, large amounts of vegetables, whole foods, grains, they really hit the, the fish uh, far heavier. But even they are very light on the meats and the sweets, as they like to call them. So way more dancing and wine than red meat uh, is the features of a Mediterranean diet. And a lot more exposure to extra virgin olive oil, of course. This is the whole food plant-based diet pyramid. And this is a diet that's really starting to catch on over the past 10 years, I would say, and starting to get a lot more exposure into the American population, including the European population. So it's not just a, a, a continental phenomenon. And uh, dependent upon vegan versus vegetarian diets, most of these uh, include minimal or no exposure to animal products, whether that be dairy uh, or eggs or meat-based products. So there definitely is a significant amount of data on the impact of nutrition on overall health outcomes. We're going to look at a couple. So this is a study looking at the American Standard Diet versus the Mediterranean diet heavy on nuts or heavy on extra virgin olive oil. And as you can see, there definitely is a significant delta between um, the endpoints of myocardial infarction stroke or death from cardiovascular cause, depending upon whether you're on the American diet or on the Mediterranean diet. So when you look at meta-analysis of dietary recommendations and study findings, what you can see is that American standard diet, which is higher on intake of processed meats, red meats, fried vegetables, sweets and desserts, does lead to an increased relative risk of coronary artery disease of about 20%. The Mediterranean diet that we just advertised uh, leads to a relative risk decrease of between 22 and 30 percent. And the vegetarian diet, which is more plant-based, whole food, excluding animal proteins, actually reduces overall coronary artery disease rates by relative 40 percent. I throw this on here just to, to point out that the American Cancer Society also feels that these things that we're talking about, and especially nutrition, do have an overall impact onto preventable cancers as well. 
So what's my prescription? So here's what I do. Uh, for the past 13 months, I've been on a whole food plant-based vegan diet. I don't take in any animal products whatsoever. But what do I recommend to my patients? This is what I tell them. Look at your overall risk factors and perceived risk. The higher your overall risk, then probably the better the diet you need to adopt. Overall, trying to limit uh, processed meats and meat proteins uh, and otherwise choosing to more emphasize non-processed vegetables and fruits ultimately will turn out to be a wise choice. But I don't think that we can set a straight diet recommendation for every patient. I think that you really need to look at their overall risk assessment and then decide what fits their need the best. For me, with my family's history, I feel like my risk is high enough that I need to maximize my opportunities with my nutrition. Now changing up gears, let's to briefly take a foray into what we know about sleep. So uh, sleep turns out to be crucial for overall health. And I don't think that that's surprising news to anybody in the audience. We're going to look at uh, a study from uh, the Journal of Sleep. So they ought to be definitive experts on all things sleep. So let's take a look at a 2007 research subject. So what this demonstrates in this study that getting the right amount of sleep definitely has an impact on mortality. And what they found is this, that if you're not getting at least six to eight hours of sleep, then there is a correlative increase in cardiovascular mortality. It goes up about 110%. Uh, unfortunately, on the flip side of that equation, if you are sleeping more than eight-ish hours per night, then that was associated with a 110% excess risk of non-cardiovascular mortality. And I'm not exactly sure what that non-cardiovascular mortality consisted of. Uh, maybe it's bed sores. So this is what mortality looks like based on sleeping. So your overall mortality is best preserved with six to eight hours of sleep per night and mortality climbs if you don't get that or if you get too much. So getting it right is probably our goal. So what's my prescription for sleep? Well, you know, I tend to get to bed pretty early. I get up at four o'clock in the morning to exercise. So I, I try to make sure I'm getting my seven, eight, nine hours of sleep per night. Uh, I follow good sleep hygiene recommendations. And I really like these uh, Headspace sleep casts, which are uh, a great way for people that have hyperactive thoughts and just uh, are hyper aroused and cannot turn their brain off. I have yet to make it through one of these recorded, almost self-hypnosis sessions. Uh, they knock me out very effectively. And then occasionally I'll use a little melatonin if I need to. I really like melatonin. It gives me very, uh, very uh, realistic dreams that are just fascinating. Uh, so what do I recommend to my patients? The same thing. Get the right amount of sleep, six to eight hours. Avoid the use of prescription sleeping aids. Try to hit sleep hygiene very heavily as your tool to get off to sleep and uh, then reap the benefits of having better control over your cortisol levels. Moving on a little bit to uh, tobacco use. I really like this. I think this is a profound statement. In the U.S., smoking tobacco is the only legal method of being killed. A little uh, ironic sarcasm, but it feels true as a primary care provider. So there's a lot that we know about uh, the ill effects of tobacco abuse, and I don't think that any of that will be super surprising to you guys. They did do a 50-year uh, progress report through the offices of the Surgeon General looking at uh, overall smoking mortalities from 1965 to 2014 and showed that uh, our addiction to tobacco led to uh, 20.8 million unnecessary deaths, which is a pretty impressive number as I think about it. I always uh, like to show this slide 
just because most of the patients and the residents that I work with, you know, they, they're they very well aware of the cardiovascular and cancer risks, the, the COPD risks of smoking, but they, but they always forget about all these other quality of life issues and health issues that are impacted by tobacco exposure, like macular degeneration, something I think about more and more now that I'm in my 50s, uh, fertility issues, uh, inflammatory joint diseases, that sort of thing. A lot of things that uh, are worse than they should be when you're inhaling pro-inflammatory substances. This goes back to that a humongous uh, meta-analysis, uh, the interheart study that we talked about earlier, and really a uh, busy slide, but what it bottom line says here is that uh, dyslipidemia and smoking issues uh, together predict about 66% of all the acute myocardial functions worldwide. So if we could just hit those two things, things, the ability to bring the number one killer of adults under control uh, is pretty impactful. So I think that that's uh, uh, always good to review that data as well. Can't hear it too often. Now here's something that you may not be aware of. So uh, this is uh, the Harvard Adult uh, Development Study. And it's a hundred year study looking at the overall quality and quantity of life on uh, male test subjects that lived in the area around Harvard. And this study has been following them through time for the past hundred years. It's, it's gone through the family as well. An interesting thing, when they crunched all the data, they looked at all the factors that are going to have an impact on quality of life and quantity of life, the number one thing that this study found was correlative was relationships. The better you were able to build and maintain quality relationships, whether that's with your spouse, your family, your community, your friends, etc., the bigger the impact that had on lifespan and quality of existence. And that was irrespective of financial, socioeconomic issues, or even overall um, early health issues. So a very profound impact. And when you think about it, that kind of correlates to what we know uh, from the interheart study, where you can see the third largest cause of coronary artery disease turned out to be psychosocial. So, you know, when we're working with our patients uh, about smoking, you know, are they smoking due to needing a coping mechanism for the stress of their toxic lifestyle? You know, are we addressing their depression, their anxiety, their mental health issues? Because when we don't, we're definitely leaving these people open to way more exposure to uh, health issues than, than they really should. And it probably is being pushed by chronically elevated sympathetic tone and uh, things like hypercortisolemia, uh, that sort of thing. You can only burn the candle on both ends for so long before you run out of candle. To recap, what the point of this conversation is, healthy lifestyles, including all of these things, are far more impactful on your overall health than this pile of prescription medications. I simply can't, and you can't, out-prescribe a toxic lifestyle. So real health care, in my impression, uh, can make a tremendous difference on the outcomes uh, for our patients and for ourselves. And, you know, looking at this slide, what it says is if we can get control of these risk factors, your ability to decrease your risk of heart disease is 90 to 95 percent, which is incredibly impactful. 
So uh, just to bring it home for you guys, uh, I'd said that a lot of my in my initial interest in this were uh, selfishly non-altruistic and based on you know my own health issues. And you can see that you know in the past my A1C has gone up to 5.8, and I am certainly a little bit on that spectrum of insulin resistance. And you can see that I also have the ability to bring that under control. Uh, in 2019, I brought it back down to about 5.23 with just exercise, uh, regulating my body fat percentage and uh, nutrition. And uh, my most recent was around 4.7, something like that. So so my, my journey on trying to be the only McNabb in my family who doesn't have diabetes has so far been effective. And I feel like these tools have got me what I needed. To, to be able to maintain that goal. Hopefully you'll find this even more compelling. So uh, this was my overall cholesterol in December of 2019. And it, it's not the worst, I'll give you that. You know, total cholesterol 205, triglycerides were a little higher, 171, and probably because of my uh, dysmetabolic issues and a little bit of hyperglycemia. But this was on a diet of no red meat. Uh, I haven't had red meat in my diet uh, for probably 25, 30 years. Uh, I was primarily uh, subsisting on ahi tuna, tilapia, egg whites, chicken, that sort of thing, and working out six days a week, like I had said. And, and just because of poor protoplasm, this was the best cholesterol that I could mount. And at that time, my primary care provider had me do a calcium scoring test just because of my early heart disease and my, my father. And unfortunately, I, had, I was building a little uh, calcium placking in my LAD. And so based on that finding in this cholesterol panel, I, I got uh, more aggressive with it. And I switched over, as I had said already, over to a complete vegan diet, which I've been on for about 13 months now. But I think that you'll find this fascinating. Take a real good look at this before cholesterol. And now look at this. After three weeks of not ingesting foods with cholesterol in them, look what happens to my cholesterol panel. My total cholesterol drops to 100, and my LDL drops to 42. Uh, and look at my triglycerides that were in the 170s. It dropped all the way to 86. And this is only a handful of weeks of being on this diet in between those those two labs that I showed you. So the thing that's profoundly impactful about this is what we know about uh, IVIS studies, intravascular ultrasound. When you look at atherosclerotic plaguing extraluminally with an ultrasound catheter inside of a coronary artery, you can really see those lakes of foam cells and those those plaques that are not obvious on a heart cath, but those are the ones that are going to rupture and give you that heart attack. Well, we knew from those IVIS studies that if you can aggressively get people's LDLs down to 70 or less, that those atheroma foam cell lakes start to resolve. They will go away. And of course, in those studies, they were using really aggressive statin therapy to get that done. But I was able to get that LDL into the 40s with just a, a vegan diet. So uh, I saved myself some money on some statins and uh, hopefully I'm also gaining the benefits of the uh, regression in my, whatever's building up in my uh, LAD as well. So to conclude guys, I think that we need to pursue actual healthcare. Secondary prevention is great. But we need to engage with our patients in promoting healthy lifestyles that are really held up with the foundations. Activity, good nutrition, good overall healthy non-toxic lifestyles.